Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 to 16. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you do give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honoured by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your Father, who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father, who is unseen. And your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Amen. Reading from Isaiah chapter 58. Shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the house of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you haven't seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you've not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarrels and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for a man to humble himself? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying on sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this kind of fasting I have chosen to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe him and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then your light will appear forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here I am. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like a noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land 
and will strengthen your frame. You'll be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorers of streets with dwellings. If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, and if you honor it by not going your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord and I will cause you to ride on the heights of the land and to feast on the inheritance of your father Jacob. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. So there are Bibles over on my right hand side on the table at the back if you should need one to follow uh, the sermon and the passage that I'm going to be talking about. Um, I deliberately chose the passage that Gary read for us, uh, which the one in Matthew 6, because it talks about some things that are common to the passage in Isaiah 58, which is the one that I will be speaking on mostly today. It talks, for example, at verse 1 of Isaiah 58, of raising your voice like a trumpet. Um, in the passage that we have looked at in Matthew, it talks about not making the things you do in the public to be uh, announced by trumpets surrounding you. So there are good trumpets and there are bad trumpets. Not everybody who plays a trumpet is Miles Davis. Um, different people have different abilities and some people should leave the trumpet well alone. And it is in the same way that when you are doing something to help others, you should not, as we say in the English language, trumpet it. Now, Isaiah makes a point that is well said elsewhere in the New Testament in the letter that James wrote. James makes the point in his letter that faith without works is dead and some people say to me as a pastor they say well Darren I believe that I believe in Jesus but how do I know that I am saved I don't know how I am supposed to test that but the Bible makes it quite clear that if you have faith, and it is true faith, then coming from that will be the kind of works that are fit for those who believe. If you do not do good things, the suggestion is rather that you are not saved because your faith is not growing. And this is hard. Even some of the great men of the church have battled with this. Um, Martin Luther, the great German theologian of the Reformation period, argued to have the letter of James removed from the Bible. He said it was an epistle of straw and that God should burn it up and destroy it because it taught that faith is shown through good works. But really, this is very much the message of the Bible. We saw in the sermon we were looking at two weeks ago that when Isaiah was teaching in chapter 56 the word of the Lord, he said that people should prepare themselves for the day of the Lord, by doing righteous acts now. And also we see this in 
the life of John the Baptist in the New Testament who came only months before the ministry of Jesus even that Jesus was coming and we would come to believe that salvation is by faith alone John the Baptist said that we should ready ourselves for his coming by beginning to perform righteous acts and so therefore these two things cannot be separated out some people who come to church are more religious than other people and you might say well what do you mean by that Darren religion is a way by which you help yourself to stay close to God it is a routine and practice you build into your life in order to live for God some people say to me well I am not religious at all I have faith but then they come to church on Sunday which in a sense is an act of religion it is a good thing that they come to church on Sunday because it builds structure into their service of God but sometimes religion can be a destructive thing and this is what we see in Isaiah 58 because the people in Isaiah 58 that Isaiah is condemning by the word of the Lord are people who fast you know maybe they choose a day a week or a day a month or something like this where they refrain from eating now I'm not talking here about some of the silly things that we do um, in terms of uh, sometimes people do this during Lent they say oh, I'm going to fast from chocolate during Lent now really there's no harm in that it might change your waistline but there's it's not really what God is looking for but the Bible makes it clear here that if you are refraining from food for one day a week or one day a month and that is the only sign of your devotion from God then that's no good either it says in verse 4 your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists you cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Then in verse 5, is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord. And God makes it clear that when we fast, if we should fast, then it is more important that on that day we show justice to those who are being treated unjustly. We give food to those who are hungry. We clothe those who are struggling in that way. And we live a life of peace. And this is the idea. We are to loose the chains of injustice. So in a sense there is a negative and a positive side to something like 
um, fasting. There are two elements also to something like praying. The negative, I mean, is that we say, no, today I will not eat. And as Jesus said in Matthew's Gospel, when we do not eat, we should not make it obvious to others. I remember one gentleman in a church that I used to pastor, and when somebody offered him a biscuit on a Sunday, he would say, oh no, not today, because I'm, I'm fasting. And the whole point in Scripture is that if you're going to fast, you don't let others know. It is something where you are making a decision in yourself. And it is between you and God. But then the positive side of fasting is that on that day, and also on every day, we look for ways that we can serve the poor. We look the, for ways that we can serve those who are suffering injustice. I've been talking quite a lot over the last few weeks about the fact that we have a new government and with a new government comes new opportunity. And we should be pressuring our government to do what is right. And to do what is right in line with the teachings of God. Shortly before the election, um, a small group of us approached our local MP about something that we thought was unjust. I should not name the local MP because I don't want to embarrass him. Um, and he said, well, I can't deal with this at the moment because I have to deal with the whole business of the election. I'm not sure that's a great excuse, but uh, priorities, I guess. But then the election has come to an end. The gentleman in question was re-elected and still nothing has happened. And so the victim of unjust injustice remains a victim of injustice. And one thing that you find out as a pastor and as a minister is that you have a certain degree of influence, but it is a small degree compared to those who are councillors on the local council or those who are MPs in Parliament. And you are looking for those who are elected representatives to do what is right. We are also to share our food with the hungry, it says in this passage. We are to do what we can to make a difference on our streets. And again, this is going to take a little bit of time to do that. It will mean that your day will need to be altered a little. This is in verse 7. And again, he's talking about the nature of a true fast it says is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them or not to turn away from your own flesh and blood now it seems to me every time i go up and down king street there are businesses that have gone out of business there are places that are boarded up. I noticed just this last week, there's a pub that is opposite uh, the point where Ravenscourt Road uh, meets King Street, and that's got all metal shutters up there now be to stop people entering because it's gone out of business. Um, there's one place on King Street which seems like <laughs> it's almost like it's got a curse upon it, but I think 
in the last few years there have been six or seven businesses in there and nobody makes a success and the place there the last weekend the landlords forced their entry into the cafe to reclaim the building but one thing we have plenty of on King Street is signs of poverty and charity shops and you know sometimes you think well how can I help that person who is begging on the street first thing is that you can ask them what they want second thing is you can refer them to the church and its agencies because we do that but the fact that there are many charity shops around that's kind of a a double blessing because you can go in there and you can find cheap clothes and secondly in buying them from the charity shop you give money to the British Heart Foundation or cancer research or something like that it's a double blessing you know I mean, if you're trying to help a guy and you come out with a pink flowery blouse, that's maybe not going to help too much. But if you come out and the people have fairly good quality shirts, decent pair of trousers, and so you can help people for very little. You can help the research into cancer or whatever, and also you can help the person who is on the street. I mean, this is more obvious when um, winter comes around. You know, I don't have anywhere really that I can offer people where they can sleep. But even a little way, when winter comes around, you know, there's this company, I don't know if you've ever heard of them, um, they're probably not doing a lot of business in the world uh, they're called Amazon if you ever heard of Amazon but they sell pretty much everything in the known universe they're like one of those old fashioned shops you used to go into where the, the shop has every kind of screw or bolt or whatever in the shop and I found out that these places, these Amazon outlets, they sell sleeping bags. You know, and I say, Amazon probably desperately needs my money uh, so I could give them a blessing, but also I could buy somebody a sleeping bag. It's a limited value gift because once it gets wet, that's about the end of its usefulness but it does help for a little while now we should be working towards loosening the chains of injustice we should be setting the oppressed into a better situation we should be sharing our food with the hungry providing people with clothes but we also need to do some talking the Bible says and there's two kinds of talking that goes on here the first is again in verse 1 that we are to tell people when they are doing things that are wrong but that's a hard thing to do and what the Bible is saying here is that we should address the whole of the community rather than individuals we are not to condemn individuals because the other side of the coin is made quite clear in verse 9 it says if you do away with the yoke of oppression 
with the point pointing finger and malicious talk. It's very easy to say that man there is not living as he should. That man there is not pleasing God. You know, I see street preachers in Hammersmith who do this. They target people as they're passing. It's an ugly thing. And the churches of God should be embarrassed and ashamed when they do that. Because Jesus tells us that we are not to judge others. I once sat in the most useless Bible study I've ever been in because the group who were studying were looking at this passage that was saying, do not judge others. And they spent over half an hour debating what it meant. In what situations was it not appropriate to judge others? Because obviously we as Christians judge others because we are the righteous. What nonsense. The teaching of Jesus couldn't be clearer. We are not to judge others. If we have a message for the community, we tell the community, we have a phrase in Yorkshire, where I come from, uh, which says, if the cap fits, wear it. You leave the decision as to whether somebody is doing wrong to themselves. You're not meant to belittle them or humiliate them. The only person you should be humbling is yourself. And if you humble yourself to bring injustice down, to restore people against the enemy of poverty, to set the oppressed free and share your food with the hungry, that's the kind of humility God wants. And if you want to fast on top of that because you have a particular thing you're seeking God's face for, then by all means fast. That would then be a good means of fasting. But if you are cruel and harsh and judgmental, then you can pray all night and all of the day. You can pray five times a day at fixed hours and fixed stations. You can bring your prayer mat and you can bow down on it. But if you are judgmental, God will not listen to you. God will not hear your voice and God will not hear your prayer. We are told in scripture the way in which we should pray and the way in which we should pray involves looking out for others and forgiving others when they wrong us. This is the way forward for the servants of God. And in that way, we will bring the glow of God's love into our homes. We will bring the glow of God's love into our workplace or office environment. We will bring the glow of God's love wherever we go. But woe betide us if we should fail. Amen.